So I hope to uh, bring the same level of respect to um, community vernacular that, um, that Article 25 have done in the area of building and construction. Um, and talk a little bit more about the energy aspects as, um, as Deborah um, you know, noted. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to do three things only. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about why I think um, we need to tackle the issue of energy resilience and why the most effective solutions uh, will come from building on that local capacity. Um, so I'll, I'll draw on my own work in uh, Nepal and Malawi currently. Um, and then I'll talk specifically about uh, the collaboration with the BRE Trust on their quantifying sustainability after natural disasters, the QSAN tool. Um, and then I'll conclude with some reflections uh, on the contribution of this kind of research that that can make. So now I realize this is the obligatory slide on the sustainable development goals. Here we are. Uh, we're looking specifically at number seven. Um, the, the sustainable development goals are uh, 17 interconnected goals, but underneath that there's 169 targets that Deborah mentioned, um, all to be achieved by 2025, 2030. Um, and you know, it's a plan of action that's for people, planet, um, and also prosperity. Um, in terms of energy, number seven, uh, one billion people around the world don't have access to electricity, but there are also three billion who don't have access uh, to, who really rely on traditional fuels for cooking and heating. Um, so num uh, SDG seven uh, calls for action to um, affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. So we want it all, people. Um, and it has specific targets on energy access, on renewable energy, and also energy efficiency. So improving the productivity that we can gain from uh, that energy access. Um, so during my time as chair of, the, uh, of UCL's uh, Energy and Development Group, uh, we conducted a review of um, energy and the sustainable development goals and found that action on energy was required on 113 uh, of the 169 targets that I mentioned. Um, so in this diagram, you can see the 169 targets around the outside, and each one of those lines represents a linkage with energy. So you can see that um, energy relates to the achievement all, actually of all of the sustainable development goals, not just number seven. Uh, so for example, energy systems um, have, to, have to change in order to address climate change um, and, to, uh, and to reduce pollution. Um, that the structure of governance and energy systems need to improve uh, to address uh, justice issues between and within nations. Um, and also on indoor air pollution as well, um, in terms of health outcomes for women and children, um, clean and access to uh, clean fuels for cooking in particular will make a huge amount of difference. So the message uh, here is that we need urgent act action on energy systems in order to achieve all of the sustainable <coughs> development goals. So at the same time, developing countries are facing multiple stresses um, and shocks, including climate change, natural hazards, as we saw in Article 25's um, speech, um, conflicts that can really cause disruption to those critical infrastructures, including energy. Um, and so progress towards those sustainable development goals uh, we have been discussing is simply impossible without addressing um, these emerging uh, resilience issues. Um, for those affected by humanitarian crises, um, the situation is even more difficult. Um, there's limited funding policies and practices around the use of sustainable energy, um, and currently there's little coordination and planning around energy and relief uh, efforts, although there are efforts to improve this. Um, and nowhere is this more important than in cooking, um, leaving users and, um, and with energy sources that cause fires, 
um, health problems from indoor air pollution, um, and expose women and children um, to violence whilst collecting firewood. So access to sustainable energy uh, can enhance health, safety, productivity, and security in these situations, um, and also bridge the gap between development and humanitarian response um, by creating opportunities for education, for enterprise, and for innovation. So what then is needed? I think you know, really good definition for resilience um, comes from the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, IFRC. Um, and their definition includes multiple levels um, and acknowledges the long-term development aspirations of communities. Um, that is, resilience isn't merely about maintaining the status quo. So you know, in their definition, they talk about the ability of individuals, communities, organizations, and countries uh, exposed to disasters um, and crises with underlying vulnerabilities uh, to anticipate, to prepare for, reduce the impact of, cope with, and recover from. So you can see the whole cycle there um, from shocks and stresses that are both long-term and uh, short-term. So communities, though, are far more active in achieving this resilience than we would conventionally think. Um, here is a group of farmers uh, in rural China uh, putting up their own wind turbine um, with the help of their local technician. Um, I was helping them with the installation uh, as part of my PhD research on capacity development for renewable energy projects. And I was just really impressed uh, with the level of technical knowledge that the farmers had um, and also of the local technician. Um, they were able to uh, replace individual parts within uh, the uh, inverters, um, something that I would struggle to do as an engineer if I didn't have access to uh, the actual circuit diagram. Um, and the farmers themselves uh, also did the wiring within the households. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, in Nepal, um, I lived and worked there um, on secondment uh, with Engineers Without Borders to a local NGO in uh, 2009. Um, and in 2015, Nepal experienced a series of devastating earthquakes um, and aftershocks uh, that took the lives of 9,000 people and destroyed over half a million homes. Um, so after the earthquake, I called my colleagues um, to see if they were okay to begin with. Um, and they mentioned that something very interesting, that people were salvaging their own renewable energy systems. So it's something that I hadn't really heard of before. Um, and so I actually called around um, other colleagues who had recently responded to um, the tsunami in Indonesia and um, the typhoons in the Philippines, um, looking for data. So they didn't actually have the data required and they said, you know, we have anecdotal evidence, um, but we're not able to support programs um, in that area because we don't have the fundamental research to do that. Um, so I was actually tasked to gather that um, in the year after the disaster in Nepal, working with uh, the government um, on their reconstruction program. Um, and I led a survey of households and communities in four earthquake affected districts on how people were coping and meeting their own energy needs. So quite straightforward. Um, we found that full restoration of energy services was quite slow, that households and communities were indeed very proactive in restoring some of their energy services um, using informal networks. Um, and as a result, inequalities in which communities have managed to restore um, their energy services were exacerbated. And it's not just about one-time events like the major earthquake in 2015. Um, communities are already finding ways um, with more everyday resilience challenges. So Nepal is vulnerable to annual floods and landslides and climate change will reduce the size of glaciers um, in the Himalayas by at least a third, um, vastly affecting the downstream agriculture in the region. And communities are shifting their settlements along with their energy systems um, and also negotiating uh, sharing of water resources between energy production 
um, using microhydro systems and agricultural irrigation. So I've been also been working in Nepal over the last um, few years um, on the Agro Industries and Clean Energy in Africa project, um, which looks at the potential for industries like tea, coffee, um, and sugar to catalyze energy access in rural areas. Um, in Malawi, livelihoods and food security are being threatened by cycles of um, both drought and flooding. Um, and in April uh, last year, I was um, in Malawi straight after Cyclone Idai. Um, and so energy security and energy resilience was very much at the forefront of policymakers' minds. Um, people felt that a portfolio of renewable energy projects um, and mini grids may help to diversify their power supplies away from um, their large hydro dams. Um, and that there's also an emerging role um, through their political decentralization process for local governments um, to have a role in implementing energy access projects in rural areas. Um, for example, there are plans to appoint um, district energy officers um, to support these energy access initiatives. So what do I hope to achieve by putting the word community um, in front of energy resilience? Um, it's really just to highlight the important role that communities can make um, on this issue. Um, in fact, communities are really strategic um, in accessing energy services after disasters, um, as I've shown uh, in China with individual farmers getting involved, in Nepal where informal governance came to the fore, um, and in Malawi where there's a role for local government bodies to take part. Um, and yet we often plan as if communities and households are merely recipients um, of energy services. This is both in humanitarian context and also in development um, programs as well. And we also plan as if we, energy services are independent um, from each other. Um, so rather than being flexibly deployed and adjusted by its end users to meet their needs. Um, so what would actually happen if we could acknowledge what communities are actually doing um, about energy resilience and accessing energy and include them in the planning process, um, much as Article 25 have done on shelter and what would we have in terms of resilient energy systems? And could we reduce uh, the cost of delivery? So over the last 18 months, uh, I've been running a series of workshops, uh, bringing together stakeholders um, around these issues and to co-produce a research agenda. Um, this was supported by the UK uh, Energy Research Centre's Whole Systems Networking Fund. Um, as well as um, DFID's Energy and Economic Growth Program. Uh, the networks, um, the workshops brought together networks from um, disaster risk reduction and also energy access um, across the UK, Nepal and Malawi, but also bringing in um, expertise from the South Asia region and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so they're more regional meetings. Um, and it was really the first time you know, a lot of the people who attended who had spent a whole day thinking about energy resilience. They knew it was on the horizon for them as part of their roles. Um, and this was, you know, their chance to really put the picture together. And we found it quite useful to think um, about creating technology to support um, energy resilience across the disaster risk reduction cycle, which is up on the, on the screen. Um, and so that's how can we build on existing energy resilience strategies and local innovations to prevent, prepare, respond, and recover from disasters. Um, so both meeting the short-term needs and the long-term development goals of communities. Um, and that community resilience really has two components, um, both how robust the physical system actually is um, and how we can contribute more broadly to community resilience. So we've talked about the fact that communities have their own resilience strategies. Um, and we know that we need some integrated solutions. So what are we going to do about it? Um, 
So my team and I are working to address this over the next um, four years um, by taking a deeper dive into how communities, um, what they're doing around energy resilience um, in Nepal and Malawi. Um, we're developing quantitative and qualitative uh, measures for community energy resilience. Um, we're also co-creating um, solutions with four communities, two in Nepal and two in Malawi. And we're going to <coughs> use that learning um, in order to uh, build design tools that can help um, engineers and communities um, to plan um, around energy resilience. So of course I'm not working alone um, on this. Uh, we're working in partnership with uh, Mazuzu University in Malawi, Trubavan University in uh, Nepal, uh, the BRE Trust, um, Actec, um, all in the UK, um, and we're supported by expertise at Loughborough University um, in terms of the Low Carbon Energy for D Development Network, um, and also the Centre for Renewable Energy Systems Technology. And we're well advised um, by Practical Action, Chatham House, and the Safe Humanitarian Working Group um, that represents um, uh, relief efforts around, uh, around energy. So now I'd like to take a deeper dive actually into one of the very last um, objective around tools. And, um, and I'm working with the BRE Trust and contributing to uh, the Quantifying Sustainability in the Aftermath of Natural Disasters or QSAND um, self-assessment tool. Um, it was really developed to fill a gap in the sector um, in terms of a comprehensive sustainability tool. Um, that contains elements of uh, benchmarking as well. And its aim in part is to support um, improved delivery um, of um, beneficiaries uh, to, um, affected by natural disasters and encouraging this more holistic approach. Um, QSAN's development took um, three years with a project board um, that, you know, that was chaired by the BRE and the IFRC. Um, the International Federation of the Red Cross. So, in terms of aims of objectives, um, I guess I just really wanted to highlight that it's a very practical tool that can be used by agencies and communities themselves to improve their sustainability efforts. Um, it also addresses much of the um, disaster risk reduction cycle from relief to recovery and reconstruction. Um, and as I mentioned, it's both a decision-making tool, a design tool, um, and a benchmarking um, set of guidelines. And uh, this is a list of the different uh, components within QSAND. And I just wanted to highlight how comprehensive it is, including a set of cross-cutting issues that you can see um, on the right. Um, I focus very much on the, um, on the energy sector and um, and that's where our collaboration really uh, takes place. Um, research on energy planning uh, for resilience has really focused on uh, large scale and centralized systems um, operating um, under high uncertainty. Um, considerable work has already been done um, on how energy and other critical infrastructures are linked, um, including modeling cascading failures. But those models on energy planning um, have really been developed in countries with um, quite centralized uh, energy infrastructures. So when we're looking at countries where um, energy systems are still being built and are taking a more of a decentralized approach, these uh, models may not be uh, so applicable. So our co collaboration addresses the knowledge gap by focusing on energy planning at the community level, so not at the uh, national level, and we don't just want to look at energy, we want to look at how energy interacts with other sectors um, <coughs> covered by the QSAN tool, um, such as water and shelter. And we'll map the synergies and trade-offs between, um, between those uh, sectors using case studies um, and contribute back to this practical um, tool um, as a way to help communities to plan their own um, systems. And we're really pleased um, to be supported by the BRE Trust and uh, EPSRC on a new PhD studentship um, that focuses on uh, 
on building these tools. So um, that's going to be launched really soon. So if you or anyone that you might know might be interested, please come and talk to me um, after. So I also wanted to talk about um, another project that I'm currently working on, uh, which is the Modern Energy Cooking Services Program. Um, it's uh, funded by the UK Aid Program um, for 40 million pounds over the next um, few years. And it's trying an alternative approach um, to look at um, biomass, eliminating biomass cooking and integrating it with questions um, of clean cooking into energy access planning. So I lead the humanitarian stream um, on how this could be achieved in displacement contexts. And I think there are some important links that QSAN um, can make in terms of looking at cooking alongside uh, other energy services and other components uh, within the tool. So finally, I wanted to offer um, three reflections on the contribution that this kind of research um, can make to energy transitions globally. Recent falls in prices to solar photovoltaic um, and storage techni technologies, combined with innovative business models, are changing how the energy access sector works dramatically. Decentralized options like renewables, storage, smart grids, and the internet of things are starting to challenge this centralized energy model. Um, developing countries who have lower levels of investment um, in centralized grids have an opportunity um, to, um, for these alternative generation offers, um, options, and there's a huge potential uh, for them to develop that. Um, so the energy access space is really dynamic and disruptive technologies um, and innovations are really going to challenge the incumbent um, grid situation. So the three reflections, um, that this kind of work challenges the traditional view um, of how innovation uh, happens from the lab to the field. Um, it asks the question, could innovation from the field be improved and in, in the lab and be usefully transferred? Um, it's not just about technologies, but it's really the approach that can be transferred. And that the impact that research can make hinges on collaboration. Um, and that co-designing the research questions is more important than the implementi implementation um, of that research agenda. Um, and that this work contributes to the field, the emerging field of humanitarian um, engineering. That's an engineering profession that responds to humanity's greatest challenges. <laughs> Um, and the way to do this is to address the sustainable development goals in an integrated way, just as the QSAN tool does, um, and starting um, with the community to co-design those solutions and unlocking innovation. So thank you very much. <laughs>